Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I'll briefly talk about a tendency that I've noticed in a lot of young postcolonial work, mostly coming out of former colonies. And that is a tendency to look at the word in very strict essentialist and binaristic terms. Right. And what do I mean by it? I often hear the term West invoked and East invoked, right? And then the traits of the West and the East are essentialized as if they are immutable, as if they are unchangeable. And I believe that that's kind of not the right way of doing post-colonial studies. Now, if you look at the three major theorists, Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, Homi Baba, you will notice that even though they have strident criticisms of colonialism and colonial past and colonial history, they also focus very heavily on a way of dealing with literary text and the politics in which there are no immutable this and them, right? There is a critique of power, but it's not an essentialist critique of power. Now, a lot of people attribute strategic essentialism to Gayatri Spivak, right? But that argument is read very reductively. I mean, when she talks about strategic essentialism, what she was talking about is that at a certain point in colonial struggle or anywhere else, you do assume a larger essentialized identity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that essential identities exist and they are immutable. Now, the problem with the binaries is that they trap you within the same structure of thought in which the colonizers themselves were trapped, right? And this insight, this viewpoint comes to me of all the places from Paulo Freire. You know, after I read him carefully, I realized that part of what he's trying to do there is teach us as to how to safeguard against essentialisms, but also against these strict binaries, this us versus them mentality. That's why in Freire, if you read him carefully, I think it's in chapter two, but also in chapter one, he doesn't only talk about the liberation of the oppressed. He also talks about the liberation of the oppressors because they themselves are caught within the inhumane system that they have created, right? So there is a possibility of incorporating the oppressor other into the project of liberation. But the reason also I am opposed to these kind of binaries is because, as Fanon would say it, you know, from the, not from the wretched of the earth, but from black skin, white masks towards the end, is that it kind of encourages a philosophy of perpetual victimhood, right? Instead of giving us a philosophy of liberation and struggle. So what I teach to my students is the idea that they should not generalize, they should particularize even their critiques of power. And they should not imagine a purist and nativist identity for the natives, right? Because the native cultures themselves had a lot of problems, gender problems and everything else. And those problems get heightened by the colonial experience but also leave room there where we can dare to, to adopt whatever we think is liberating and useful and progressive in the post-colonial cultures. Similarly, the insistence should also be that some of our ways of thinking the world should be incorporated within the metropolitan ways of reasoning and thinking and doing things. And that's where decolonial studies comes in, right? People like Walter Manvolo. But even before that, Ngugi Thiango has a wonderful essay in which he talks about how 
the European languages have been enriched by the influence of the native languages of the colonies, right? And there is nothing wrong in enriching your own language by using the metaphors and histories and vocabularies of metropolitan languages. So the purpose is, as a post-colonialist, what you want to avoid is simple binaries, simple essentialized binaries, or what you want to avoid is these blanket condemnations of the other, may it be America or anywhere else. The critique needs to be precise and well honed and specific. Because think of it this way, just as the colonizers assumed certain things about the colonized, generalized it, essentialized it, and then built policies on it, right? We could be making the same mistake, right? Americans are this, Americans are that. Yes, the American economic system, right, which is not necessarily American anymore, right, is a brutal capitalistic system, right? But this is also the system that the Indians are following. This is also the system that the Chinese are following. We could critique American power, absolutely, or American political actions or who they side with, who do they support, right? And point out the fallacies of American foreign policy, just like Noam Chomsky does, right? But at the same time, we should also acknowledge the generosity, the sincerity, and the kindness of millions of Americans. Because if we don't do that, if we lump them with the others, right? then we are essentializing America. And that is something that as a post-colonialist, at least I will not do. I have to particularize the critique, right? Also, I mean, if you look at, let's say, Pakistan or India, these essentialist us versus them vocabularies are used by the fundamentalists. May they be the Muslim fundamentalist or Hindu fundamentalist. They are the ones who rely on these binaries. So if you are a progressive scholar and, try to, and are trying to articulate a point when you make an argument based on binary structures and strict binaries, those are the people you are aligning themselves with, right? Because they are using the same kind of argument. Same on the American right here, racialized right or religious right. They also believe in this, these strict binary structures, racial identities that are fixed and immutable. So that is one thing that I try to teach my students not to essentialize people or groups of people and also not just think in terms of the past or simply the present or an immutable divide between East and West, but rather place yourself like Baba does somewhere in the middle, which is more productive, right? Where you can assert that we do kind of work that is changing Western cultures, that is changing at least the academy, and that that kind of work is necessary, right? But then where you are also open to accepting ideas that may come from somewhere else that may not be original native ideas, but that can be tempered, that can be changed, that can be altered to suit the native needs, as long as those ideas are liberating and enable more people to be fully realized human beings in any given society. So these are some of the things that as post-colonialists we ought to do. Keep in mind and that binary structures, no matter who employs them, are reductive and often racialized and take out the possibility of change. And that the biggest place of possibility is where we are open to differences and where we accept anything that is useful from others. Now, if you are looking at the screen, it's my kitty cat who is walking about, right? So these were some of the ideas that I wanted to share because um, I've seen that in Pakistan, at least decolonial studies has become very prominent, right? But in so many ways, the way decolonialism is being articulated, discussed, and talked about is also falling prey to this binaristic structure. May it be historical experience or the present and it is becoming essentialized 
and mediated through one religion or the other, same in India. And wherever you see a culture or a debate built on binary structures, on immutable binaries, the tendency tends to be creating this other and then reducing that other as you know, this stand in for bad, stand in for evil, and then mobilizing essentialized native tropes that somehow exist out of time, right? And can change the world or change our lives. There's another thing when we mobilize essential cultural identities, because if you believe in essentialism of that kind, so then you can posit we are naturally generous, we are naturally kind, we are naturally attuned to our environment. But at the same time, when you rely on a certain kind of essentialism to make claims of identity, then your opponent's attributions to that identity, which are also essentialized, also become valid. Remember, the critique of power, the critique of colonizers and everyone else in post-colonial studies is built around this idea that identities are not essential and immutable. So anytime the colonizers attributed these immutable traits onto the natives, the resistance was, no, we can change and we are different from what you are seeing. We are many and we have different modes of living. So the argument against essentialism was always a constructivist historicist argument. So if you rely on an essentialized argument to claim anything of value in contemporary world, then you are also falling prey to the essentialist trope that others have mobilized about colonized cultures and can still mobilize about post-colonies. So these are some of my scattered thoughts on how and why to avoid binaristic essentialism if you are involved in post-colonial studies or post-colonial literary studies. Now you might have noticed, just letting you know that the setup has slightly changed. We have been in the process of moving and I'm now recording on my computer from my home office, so you don't see many books here. And uh, most of the times I'll be recording from here. I'll try to make it more interesting, but I hope the video is still useful to you. Now, if you have any questions, any concerns, anything that you would like me to further elaborate, please feel free to post your questions in the comments. And as always, uh, thank you so much for your support. I hope you're taking care of each other. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Please continue to do so. And I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.